What is up, Podheads? Tony here, back with the Potty Slate Podcast. I'm joined by Anthony. I always ask him how he's doing, but I'm going to start with something a little different. Ooh, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I think 2023 is my favorite year as a music fan of all time. See, ooh, wow. I mean, my gut reaction is like, hell no. But then I, like, I, need, to, I need to come at you and like, qual- like, qualify my answer. Mm-hmm. Jeez, man. Like 2000, to me, for some reason, stands out. 2002 2003 like a lot of the years that we've celebrated 20 year anniversaries like mm-hmm. clearly some good stuff i feel like maybe music dipped 04 05 but the 90s ruled too yeah i mean i could tell you that 93 94 when i'm listening to dookie which is over my left shoulder or listening to counting crows august and everything after which is one of my favorite albums of all time but because of the circumstances of this podcast and the ability to talk to people who are putting out records from bands that we never maybe thought we'd talk to or find bands like Nevermind or Spite House and be able to talk to them on their way up, I think it's my favorite year ever. I'm not going to lie. And so you're thinking about just from being a music fan. Yeah. As a whole. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, we've kind of, so we've been doing this for almost four years and every now and then we'll just like, We'll do a check in. How you doing? You still into it? You still like the podcast? And I feel like the last two times we've done that, I've said I think I'm the biggest music fan I've ever been. Yep. And I think I am now. I think you might might be right because my first reaction was, you know, in terms of output. Well, it's not always about output. It, it just the circumstances of everything, what you're listening to, finding old bands. Yeah, I think it's up there. If it's it not number right. one. Because we also have the history of music at our fingertips, plus everything new, plus the ability to chat with artists. Like, you know, we just hit them up, it seems like. You know what I mean? No one's, yeah. not, not a ton of people have said no. No, we've had a very good, very good stretch, and we're, we're coming off a, a really fun couple of conversations going into this one, which was also amazing. So really excited about all of it. And I do, I think that this might be my favorite year to be a music fan, just because of the circumstances a that we have the the world the music world has just thrown everything at us it's been so many good shows so many good new records bands coming out of the woodwork to reunite it's been so cool on that front just as a fan to listen to that stuff and then we've kind of talked to a lot of those bands too or bands that we both love it's got to be up there man if it's not one it's two or three well the thing is in 2023 we now have the ability to like get that holy grail record get that grail record we're like 20 years well ebay was around 20 years but not everyone was active you know as active selling now you can make things happen like that if there's a grail record like i mean i'm still buying records on discogs i'm buying posters i'm buying prints like mm-hmm. shit's expensive <laughs> it's yeah, more it expensive is. Than yeah but it's it's one of those things that like if i'm spending on that versus some of the other shit that I could be spending on, I'm happy. At least this stuff is cool and we can find some, some worth in it for us and find some worth in it for the conversations we get to have. You know, I, like this one tonight, Max LeJoie, I think I said it right. He, he told us how before uh, from Spite House, a band that we both found three or four months ago. They put a, a record out last year that's phenomenal. And uh, we were like, we file that away. We want to talk to them. And he was awesome. Oh, yeah. It's funny. We, I mean, we talk about, we talk about it when we start the conversation, but it was through Spotify. Like, I don't know if I'd, I'm surprised they hadn't crossed our radar just because of like their sound and being on new morality zine and just they're in our world. We just, it just didn't hit us. I don't know. It just didn't cross our, you know, cross our desk, so to speak. But when it did, man, I'm in baby. It, it's, it's the Venn diagram of all our music. Like they're somewhere in the middle. You know, and Max was great. And it's, yeah, Le Joie. He did, he did, uh, it was a question I asked. I was like, how do, you, how do you say it? I just didn't want to mispronounce it. I'm glad you did because I, I had neglected to put it in the document. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I found it. And I mean, we found Spite House. We, we got to talk to 
Max and and to be able to get some context behind their self-titled record that came out last year and the recently put out EP with a couple of live tracks, uh, a seaweed cover and uh, an alternate version of a song from last year, Dying Leaves. Man, really cool to get that backstory and and these guys are these guys are awesome. If you haven't heard of them, I'm glad you're here to listen and find out about it. But if you have, you know. This is a cool conversation that will enhance the music too. Last thing before we get into this, it's the I think it's the first conversation we've had where Old Orchard Beach, Maine was was name dropped. And <laughs> That's true. It put us. I didn't expect it. Put a smile on my on my face, and I hope this episode does the same. So I think we're getting into it, Max well, Lejoie. Before before you before you do Ooh. that, Wells Beach came up too, but Wells has come up a bunch of times because of our boy Spose. So <laughs> I had to throw that out there. I almost brought, I almost name dropped him when he said it, but yeah, Old Orchard Beach first time for sure. <laughs> Max Lejoie, guitarist and vocalist, Spite House, Montreal, Canada. Let's go, baby. All right, we are here with Max from Spite House. Max, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, and you? I'm doing very well. We're we're super stoked to to chat with you. We uh, Anthony and I both found your self titled record in the kind of 2023 way nowadays, right? Where you're listening to Spotify, a record you like ends or a song you like ends, and it gives you something that you've maybe never heard before, but that, that fits in that world. And yeah. I can't remember which one, but it was one from the, the self-titled from, from last year. And I was like, ooh, I like this. So immediately hit like, something to come back and check out. Uh, sent it to Anthony and we were like, yeah, no, we're in, we're in on these guys. We gotta, we gotta see if we can't talk to them. So very- awesome modern way of finding music but happy yeah. that we did and happy we found you that way awesome thanks for having me i uh, i looked at the list of uh of previous guests and i'm uh yeah it's like a lot of big names in there and it's, it's really awesome nice yeah we love we love that stuff yeah we we like all kinds of music and you guys fit like in a venn diagram of a lot of what we like, you guys like in the center. Mm-hmm. So, I, what what song was it? Was it Essence or was it Gravity or Awake? It was one it of those three. Awake. I, feel like. I think it was Awake. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's, that's the first one on the LP. Yeah, and it was. It just popped cool. up while I was driving, and, and I can't remember if I was listening to Koyo or if I was listening to Nevermind, who we had on earlier this year. Both of those bands, and that you guys came up, and I was like, "Ooh, all right, I don't know who this is. I got to find out more." And uh, you know, fast forward three months and we're talking to you tonight. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. So Max, you're, you guys are all, are you from Montreal or based out of Montreal? Uh, yeah, based off Montreal. I've been living here since, since I'm like 16 or 17 and I'm 30 now. Uh, Mark, our drummer was living in Saguenay, which is more region, uh, kind of, uh, you know, further away from the city. And our bassist, Nab, is from France, and he's been living in uh, Quebec for about five years, I think. I think Tony and I both have pretty fond memories of Montreal as a, as a youngster. Yes, <laughs> oh, we yeah. do. Yeah. yeah that was, uh, so I, I, I looked it up before we started. It's a five-hour drive from where we're at. We're located in Maine, so oh, you yeah. go right through New Hampshire, Vermont, and you're there. Uh-huh. We did Expos Games. We did uh, Warp Tour at... Is it Park Jean Drapeau? Drapeau? Yeah. 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 And then maybe some extracurricular activities at night. <laughs> some nice, of those. Nice. I went to Peel Pub. I went to the <laughs> casino and a, a club that will not be named that is no longer there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's cool. I used to go to Maine a lot uh, when I was younger to uh, the beach with my dad. We used to go every year. Old Orchard Beach? Yeah, we did that. this nice. one. Uh, Wells. Oh, yeah. Wells Beach, yeah. I yep. love it. Yeah. And uh, I can't really remember all of them, but we did a, a bunch of diff- uh, different ones. But it was like the best time I've had as a kid. So Nice. Yeah. Well, Wells Beach uh, is probably 20 minutes south of where I live. Oh, and really? Gunkwood Beach is right there. And uh, yeah, OB is yeah probably... I remember this one. Yeah. And OB awesome. is probably 10 minutes north. So, yeah, I'm right in between all those, cool. those uh, destinations for, for summer for folks. That's great. So, yeah, growing up there, uh, not there, but uh, going there. Uh, lobster became my favorite meal ever so it, love it's, it uh, love it yeah have you been back as an adult yeah i've, I, I've been back a couple of times uh, with my girlfriend and it's it's the same as it was true yep yeah i mean <laughs> so... not in a bad way like in a good way 
the same feelings and uh yeah the same fun times so how old were you when you were making those drives uh which one like uh, when i came back with with my girlfriend or with my dad when you were younger like going to old orchard and i think we started going there when i was maybe four or five and oh, okay. and we we went back every year since i was uh until i was uh maybe 12 or 13 something like that right on and we would go like with all my family my, my dad has had like uh, many brothers so they would bring their kids and yeah it was like a whole camping trip that we were doing. Well, because I ask, because if you were doing that trip when you were 12 or 13, chances are you probably get the headphones on, get the disc man going. What would have been playing in your headphones at 12, 13 on those road trips? Oh, my God. Uh, 12, I was probably listening to Green Day, Blink-182, Pennywise, No FX. I was really into skate nice. punk, I think, in that period of time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a... Oh, I see the Dookie uh, yeah, poster it's an audio behind medium, you as well. I, I didn't yeah, even... I got, the, got the Dookie poster right behind me that my wife got me for my birthday a couple years ago because I had the original when I was a kid. Oh, same nice. size, but I, I butchered it because I was 10 and didn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> so it's probably yeah. worth hundreds. It's probably... I know. It's, it's still my mom's, but it's a mess. I was so brutal with my CDs when I was younger. Like None of them could last more than a week with, uh, without you know me breaking the, the cover and yeah so I, I feel you <laughs> well you knew you had that skip protection on the yeah yeah <laughs> well some people oh, did yeah. i wasn't one of them i had like 10 second skip protection which didn't do shit yeah yeah i remember those uh not working very well in the bus uh when you know every That's time true. you hit the bump and it like it stops for like a couple seconds <laughs> kids these days don't don't know that they don't understand the struggle true i had the take off your pants and jacket I burned off of our buddy Andrew and his was fucked up. So it had a little skip in the beginning of shut up and it would always like start and then start <laughs> over. And I was, I thought that that was the way the song was forever. <laughs> mm. And then when I got it on vinyl, and listened to it. I was like, wait a second. Or like, listen to it on streaming. Like, that's not the way that shut up is supposed to go, but it was because of the skip and, and the scratches uh -huh. and just beating the shit out of this stuff when we were kids. That's funny. It also happened, you know, after that, it was like the LimeWire and download um, stuff. And you could always download the wrong version of a song. And then you thought that was the way it was. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it took you uh, buying the actual thing to uh, realize it's not the way the song goes. Yep. Allegedly. Yes. No one really down. Yeah, we didn't no steal one any actually money. downloaded. Yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Didn't steal any music from you, Lars, from Metallica. Dude, we're not, don't come after me. <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> they will find you <laughs> they will are you playing instruments at that age or is it just punk bands street punk bands warp tours type of stuff uh i play guitar since i'm probably eight or nine years old it's my dad who just one day i came home and he was like i have a gift and it was a classical guitar because yeah my dad was a teacher and um he had this uh latin player come to his school to uh i don't know to entertain the kids or something and uh he was really into it i guess and he, he was like oh i need my son to have a guitar and to have like guitar classes and and stuff like that so i started maybe at eight or nine to uh kind of play guitar i had like a couple of classes and uh every time i i was telling the teacher like i want play this and i showed them like no fx songs and they, they would laugh at me <laughs> like what the hell is this <laughs> that's amazing they, yeah. they were looking at me what's and, bro and him? Like, what the hell what the yeah hell? seriously I, I remember asking them that specific song and because i had like two teachers the, the first one i think got off to latin america to do his thing there and he recommended a, a second teacher who was very good and maybe a little more into punk rock uh, punk rock but he was like oh so you want to play this and then he would like make fun of it by going like and then i was like that's what my wife hears when she listens to my music yeah so i was like okay okay i'll learn the like basic stuff like basic exercises that you you want me uh to learn but then i need to learn those green day songs and those spending my songs <laughs> hell yeah dude and, and 
we've had conversations with different musicians about that kind of same similar story where they were maybe they were trained they had somebody who taught them and they walked in they're like yeah play i want to play van halen <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. you're not there yet man like or yeah. i want to play the you know the power chords just the you know over and over again because this is the stuff that i listen to like show me how to play that i don't need a yeah. scale i think he showed me how to play a power chord and many months later i was like i want to play more power chords and like songs and i showed him songs that i wanted to play and it was like you know the power chord we learned many months ago yeah it's that but you just move your finger for all the songs you want to learn and i was like yep. oh Oh, okay. <laughs> it's that easy? <laughs> yeah, he was kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say a snob, but he, he clearly thought that punk was not good enough, you know, as a teacher, at least. It's crazy how that, like, if that whole situation didn't happen, like, maybe you wouldn't have found guitar. You know what I mean? It's, it's always fun to, like, look back at the series of events that happened for you yeah. to get here. Do you think you would have still found it? Yes. Because the way I first heard punk rock, my, my family was always uh, very interested in music, but non, uh, there's no players uh, in my family. My dad was a, a boomer. You know, he, he loved Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Genesis, all those bands. So I grew up into that. And then uh, I, I remember a specific time that I was maybe eight years old and... Uh, Instead of going outside for a recess, we, we were inside at the computer. And uh, one of my friends had an older brother that showed him Nirvana. And he was, like, obsessed with it. And he, sh he showed me Nirvana. And I became, like, this was all I wanted to know about. And it happened kind of at the same time that my dad bought me a, a guitar without knowing that was happening. Uh, so it all kind of, yeah, coincided together. and. Uh, in a nice way, but I was almost ashamed of la liking that music at first because I mm. knew he was liking to the uh -huh. you know Pink Floyd and like uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can relate because my mom loved music and growing up in her house, and it was always it was like the Beatles old stuff, and mm -hmm. I liked it, but I was like, all right, can I listen to this Offspring CD now? Because like I want to listen to Smash <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or Green Day's Dookie or you know insert band of that time, you know. And, yeah. and she was, I put it on in the, the living room before we'd go to school. And she'd be like, what are we listening to? This is so loud and angry. I'm like, nah, it's awesome. You're wrong. This is great. So I understand yeah. that feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same thing with the, like the NoFX lyrics or uh, uh, song names. Like if my mom took the CD and looked at it, she was like, am I good mom for like buying, do, uh, buying <laughs> the CD? Yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. I, I don't speak like that. They do. Punk, <laughs> punk and Drublick? What are you buying, Max? What are you buying? All right, so not to jump ahead to Spite House, but was Spite House your first band playing guitar? Or was there uh, second bands band. before that? Second yeah. band? Oh, right yeah, on. so I had a band before, like uh, around 2015. It was called Deeper Well. I would say that we played a similar kind of music. Uh, it was, I guess, more influenced by... Lifetime, um, we had like nice. fast, so awesome. fast, fast songs, um, and it was more upbeat and less angry. And we did like two EPs with that band, and it lasted around, I think, three years. But that was my first real band experience. And then after that was Spite House, but it, it took a, a couple of years for me to uh, figure out that I wanted to sing also. So you were just playing guitar and, and Deeper Well, and then... Yeah, sang in Spite House. I did a couple of back vocals, and that's it. In the in the first band. When did you figure out that you wanted to sing? Like, what what triggered that? Uh, it was always something I kind of, you know, wanted to try, but I, I'm a very shy person, and uh, I didn't know if I could do it. I don't know, like, so the whole thing that that started Spite House is that uh, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. And soon after that, she, oh, wow. uh, she passed. And so at that moment, I was just like, I need to do, I need, uh, there's a lot of things to express here. And uh, I don't want to be in a situation in a band that I'm relying on someone else to uh, help me express that. And I, I just decided to try it. And uh, I met with my, my old friend that's like my favorite drummer. 
uh, in Montreal. And uh, the first jam, we the first practice, we had like three songs and we're like, okay, so maybe there's something there. And uh, we started recording demos. And that's basically how I learned how to sing by just redoing takes. And uh, yeah. So this was pretty recent then, right? Yeah. 20, 20, 21, maybe? Yeah, 20. Yeah. I think we started right before the pandemic uh, because I think we had two practices and then uh, I went uh, on a trip to Mexico with my girlfriend and we came back and it was March and the world shut down after that. So yeah, it's it's pretty recent that I, I sing in bands. So you guys are, you you come together, you do this, the world shuts down. Do you think mm -hmm. like, oh, maybe that was fun, but there's not going to be a chance for this? Or are you like, let's let's put our heads down and let, let's make some music and, and, you know, fine tune things and see what we can come up with. Yeah. That's more the approach we took. We were like, okay, we have like solid demos now. Let's just try to make them better. And so we, we had maybe like 12 demos. And so we re-recorded everything and perfected everything to the point that we thought it couldn't be better for where we were at that point as writers, musicians and all that. And then we sent set it out to to some labels and hope for the best without e expecting anything. And uh, uh, Nick from uh, New Morality Zine really liked it and decided to uh, to help us put it out. That's awesome! Like the so those those demos is that what ended up being the full length? No. Oh so wow. the, Well, I mean the songs, yes, but like the there's new recordings of every song from right scratch. Yeah. yeah. So we we. Like in the demo version of Lying Leaves, there's like a whole added part at the end that we thought was like super chaotic and messy that we cut. There's, there's been like a lot of refinement to the songs. And uh, I also did like a, a mentorship with uh, Jay Moss from The Feeder oh, uh, yeah. as a producer. Right on. Yeah. And so he helped me really uh, improve my skills as a mixer and uh, as a, just a music producer as well. So I think... From the demos, everything became way, way better. Well, what's interesting about like working with label is we've had a ton of bands on here where you know, they came up in like the nineties, early two thousands, where there's like mm -hmm. major label showcases and whatnot. Yeah. And in your in your case and like, you know, maybe the punk hardcore adjacent scene, it's certainly more organic. So was he just mm -hmm. like you just you get an email, it's like getting accepted to college. You get an email like, Hey, I want to work with you guys or yeah, yeah, it's almost like that, I guess. Yeah, he was like, "I love the record. Uh, I'd be interested in in hearing what you you guys' plans were." And it was in a period like everything was so uncertain with just the uh, what was happening, so we didn't know if we'd be able to tour or anything like that. But yeah, it took time also to get the record out uh, because pressing plants were so overloaded during that time. So it gave us the time to prepare and uh yeah, when everything returned to normal, we were like ready to push it and uh and go out and play shows and stuff like that. So yeah. But yes, I I remember like receiving the email and was like, Oh shit, that's sick. Like I'm no, glad yeah, that someone totally. gets the record <laughs> and that it's not like just in our minds that we seem to have accomplished something that, that we think is good and that we're proud of. So uh so that was a nice moment for sure. Yeah, and, and it came out in, in August of 2022. When did you have it done? Was it done like nine months mm. before? I think it was a full year before that it was done, then wow. sent, yep. then we waited for responses and all of that. And then I remember the vinyl plant told us that it would take nine months to get it pressed. And then it ended up taking around six. Yeah, well, that's nice. At yeah. least it's a little quicker, but... Yeah, because at nine, we were like, we, we had been working on it for so long that we were like, shit, another nine months before we can show people what we've been working on. It's, it was frustrating, but uh, it ended up happening uh, quicker and we were patient and everything worked out. So it's cool. So Max, before we came on, my, uh, my wife knew that we were interviewing a band and she's like, what kind of music do they play? And I'm mm. not like the genre police, so I wasn't going to get into it. And she wouldn't know anyway, you know, I, whatever I told mm. her. So how would you, how would you answer my wife if you asked? And this is for anyone that's listening that doesn't, that's never heard Spite House. Because there'll be some people that mm. listen to us that have never heard you. 
Uh, well, for me, it's like ni- a lot of 90s influence punk rock that we play. Yeah. There's melodic hardcore in there. There's emo. But I, I think those would be kind of the roots of the of the band. We take, uh, like, probably they, they wouldn't know this those bands, but we take a lot of influences from Seaweed, we, which we just uh, covered a song from, um, Sam I Am, Texas is the Reason, all, all those kind totally. of bands, plus everything else that we've listened to that's related to punk rock, uh, Hot Water Music, uh, Small Brown Bike, all those bands kind of mixed together. We, we get compared, obviously, uh, to Tidal Fight a whole lot, and if we could, uh, you know, talk about more modern bands, it would be them, Fiddlehead, uh, the, our drummer is a, like a very big fan of Tushi Amore, so, and we grew up like, uh, you know, going to shows like that uh, between 2010 and, and now, so that, that would be like the culmination of all those influences together and me trying to figure out how to sing, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we hear a lot of that. We were talking about it before you popped in the fiddlehead, the the title fight. Mm-hmm. It's it's certainly there in that world. So if if you're new to yeah. Spite House because of this conversation, you'll and you like those bands, like this is right up your alley. You'll like that stuff. And Thank the you. new album, uh, the the album from last year is so good. It's so good. We 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 were saying so that. Oh, thanks. Had we got into it last year, it would have been on our like top year end list. Like it's it's that good. We can't stop listening to it. And I feel Thank like you. we would have. We would have found out about you at some point, but that pesky Spotify algorithm, man, mm. it found us. It found We've us. been lucky with the, the algorithm, I feel. Uh, there's been a lot of people saying that they discovered our band that way. So, uh, yeah, we feel lucky about that. It's got to sure. make you feel good that it, it's, it's happened that way, at least a little more organically. Like, we, we're five hours away. You haven't, I don't know if you've played main probably haven't because of the circumstances of the formation and then the pandemic so mm-hmm. uh, we still found you which is cool even though yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you wouldn't have come through our town and opened for somebody and we saw you that way and because i mean mm-hmm. oftentimes that's how we would find stuff back in the day but over the last three years it's it's digging listening to spotify or you know following other podcasts that talk to, to bands and, and stuff like that. So to find mm-hmm. you and it's, it's, it's gotta be rewarding that at least the algorithm in, in some ways is, is working for you a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, I have this book right now that I haven't read yet. I don't know if you can see. Oh, it's Spotify teardown. I have yeah. not heard of that. Interesting. I have, Interesting. I have no idea if it's good or not, but someone told me to read it, but it's just to show that I have a, a little bit of interest of like how the algorithm, uh, works. And apparently it's like, you know, the more people like your song and the more people share your song and all that, then you get boosted into playlists. So I feel like maybe it's like, uh, <laughs> it's a sign that people like our music or. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah. So, so it's yeah. flattering for sure. I mean, how many, how many bands are in the world right now? I mean. Jesus, that's a great a question. question. Yeah. I mean, we, we. I'm not saying we could talk to any band right now, but obviously there's bands that are that are out of our reach. But like we we wanted to speak to you, so it's mm-hmm. kind of serendipitous the way this worked out. I would guess there's like what a million artists at least on Spotify. Gotta be, gotta be at least that. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, Max, you're reading that book. You yeah, know. I'll read it. Maybe <laughs> maybe we could find out right right now. The rest of the podcast, though, the rest of the podcast is just Max just, reading this. Yeah, book. I'll just <laughs> excerpts from the chapter book. one. Page one. <laughs> Chapter four. What is the value of free? Ooh, all right. All right. <laughs> mm, very good question. All right. Well, I know <laughs> on another podcast that I listen to, there's a lot of debate about the value of a stream and, mm-hmm. and, and like the, the yeah, the, the value of a stream. And it has nothing to do with the payout. It's all about mm-hmm. Spotify taking the metrics, where you yeah. were when you listened, the time of day. Oh. Uh, all that stuff. So there's there's a lot of data points there. So yeah, maybe mm-hmm. uh, we'll have you on again, and you can read an excerpt from it. Yeah, I'll be a, a Spotify expert. But probably <laughs> this book is dated, and everything that it says is will be like outdated. Well, I, yeah, exactly. As soon as we figure out the rules, they change them on you, and you're back to square one trying to figure out the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see when it was uh, published. 2017. Oh yeah, it's like a whole different world. 
Yeah. It really is back then. Anyways. So, Max, when you told us your influences, when you guys, because you're a three piece, when you guys mm-hmm. got together oh, to I write. Oh, I didn't even, uh, uh, um, sorry, I, I didn't even mention Jawbreaker, but now that you mentioned the three piece oh, yeah. thing, like Jawbreaker, Blink 182, Alkaline Trio, all of those too. Yeah, Man. sorry <laughs> for interrupting. No, no, no. You, like, like I was saying at the beginning of the episode, like the Venn diagram of what we're into mm-hmm. matches pretty much with every band you've said. And so those are your influences. When you guys are writing, are mm-hmm. you, did you have any early goals? Like, hey, we want to sound like this, or hey, we want to stay in this world. Were there any like goalposts? My goal when I write is to have Mark approve the riff. Nice. <laughs> no, but like, um, I often, the way I write. Mark, Mark is, your drummer, not Mark Hoppus. Well, if Mark Hoppus w- would approve <laughs> any songs we make, I, I'd be pretty happy. But um, the way I write usually is I, I just get an idea when I, I'm on a walk or something and it needs to get out. And it usually comes with the melody and the a chord progression. So I'll, I'll come back from the walk or even make like um, vocal notes. And then just try to write it on the acoustic guitar and record something as soon as possible. And uh, if it sticks into my head and I just can't get rid of it, then it means I need to show it to the band. And sometimes it doesn't uh, work. Uh, sometimes uh, it goes in a direction that maybe is not Spite House or, you know, it doesn't feel like Spite House. And sometimes they like it. And sometimes they hate it, but I insist on it. And then they end up liking it down the road. Love it. But we, we don't have, I, I think we just like have listened to those bands so much that it's just like a part of us kind of now. And we just uh, try to play something that will work with what I want to express and the, the, the feelings I want to get out. Yeah, that's, it's fun to hear that process because everybody's got a little bit of a different one but like mm-hmm. to, to hear that you know, if you're out on a walk and is that where you like do your best thinking for for writing or is that like a just an instance that it does happen well since the pandemic i have a dog so the numbers of walked have uh, increased by a lot yeah yeah, um, yeah. and i think i'm a, a little bit add i get lost in my thoughts and uh i think that's an instance of it that I get like hyper focus on something that's going on in my brain and I just need to get it out to stop thinking about it. But I would say that, yeah, most of the writing in Spite House came that way. And sometimes it, it was just like me and Mark trying to improvise something and then a song came out of it. Sometimes it's just like a, there's a natural kind of vibe and energy that goes on in a practice and it creates a song and everything comes together at the same time. And that's cool too. It's very uh, rewarding when, when it does that. I'll say this. I can definitely relate to the dog walking thing. Like that's when, mm-hmm. that's when I, one, I listen to the most music is on a dog walk and I'll like, I'll keep the walk going if there's a, if there's tunes that I like. Mm-hmm. And that's when I think of uh, like episode ideas for this podcast. It's like during those walks, I'll listen to nice. a band and I'll be like, let's do a deep dive on that album. And I'll text Tony and he'll be like, yeah, or no, you know, same type of thing. <laughs> and then I'm listen- like, wait a second. No, you're right. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's terrible ideas. Sometimes it's great ideas. So, <laughs> But you need to have them, right? Yeah. You need to have those ideas, whether or not they're good. Like it's good to spitball, throw it out there because something else may come out of it. So yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Are you listening to music too? Me? Yeah, like on those walks. You know, that's when you said you you come up with the ideas, but are you also listening to music? And maybe that influences you too? So what I'm doing right now for most of my work income is record and mix bands. So I usually don't listen to music uh, when I go on walk because it's my break from hearing music. So, and also I like to talk to my dog, uh, <laughs> nice. because I, I think that we, um, pretty much have, have the same ADD problem. So my dog will go like <laughs> in a direction and just be like completely unaware of everything around them. And, uh, I get the same way. So talking to the dog, like keeps me in the moment and in the walk when I tend to drift too much, you know, in my ideas. So. 
I, I actually prefer listening to music when I go for runs, which I did a, a lot more uh, in the, the past couple of years. Yeah. Nice. Because it, it keeps the energy going and it keeps me motivated to, to go further. And uh, yeah, so I listen to a lot of hardcore punk and, and stuff like that when I run. Yeah. When you're writing any music uh, that's mm -hmm. for your band, uh, are you listening to music then or are you shutting that off and just trying to focus on what you're doing i try to shut it off yeah yeah and uh, usually when i listen to music it's more to compare after it's written like it, uh, as references uh for for the mixes or mastering stage and i'm like okay so am i super far off and uh, f from the bands i you know that uh, we want to kind of sound like or that we admire so Max, you're you're in a band, you're recording bands. When you're yeah. on dog walks, you're thinking about bands and music. Mm -hmm. Do you take a break? Do you ever take a break? I have to because if not, I, I would lose my girlfriend. <laughs> of course, smart. That's smart, right there. Can, can relate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's been uh, I've been involved with music a lot in those past years, and uh, it's been very fun and a lot of work and. Uh, yeah, I love uh, how it makes me come out of my shell and meet people and talk with people that uh, we have like common interest. And I find that those people are usually becoming friends because we have so much in common from music. And that's the, I think the best aspect of it. So it's been like a huge part of my life in the, the past year, past few years. And um, yeah, I, I feel like I, I kind of always wanted that and never was fully getting it. And now I, I like, I'm surrounded with music, playing music all the time, practicing when I'm not, uh, because I have uh, two, two other bands. And, and when it's the weekend, wow. then I, I'm recording bands. So it's like a lot of music. And so that's why also I listen to less music probably because I'm just always at a show or practicing or yeah, being involved with it. So the... Not to dial it back to the three piece, but I, I was just thinking with a three piece, I'm sure you have more input like per person, like proportionally, mm -hmm. but was there ever a thought just for you to go front man or was it going to be guitar? Cause like that's, I'm just thinking about live. I know you guys hitting the road here soon, but like live, mm -hmm. that's a lot to be the full-time singer and the guitarist. Like it's a lot. Yes. After a set, I'm usually exhausted. I don't know. The guitar is such a part of me that uh, I would like to try just fronting a band, like maybe a hardcore band one day. Uh, but for that band specifically, how it's written and, and everything, I feel like I need to be playing guitar while I sing for this one. And, and even I want to keep it as a trio. Like I've been told like, oh, have you ever thought of adding an, a second guitar and all of that? But I feel like the chemistry between the three of us are is so good that I, I wouldn't want to try to mess with it and also like I, I mentioned earlier so some of my favorite bands were trios and uh, I feel that it it's asking more of every musician to be less uh, in uh, in numbers that it's it's very, it's like a, a challenge and it, it's making us better musicians and I I really like the the vibe of it that's like when you, you maybe you build a super team in basketball and you're asking people to take less shots. If you add another person, you're asking them to take less shots and, and yeah, be less involved. That's a good point. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, it works for the three of you. I just in what you've put out to the world to this point, uh, mm -hmm. I don't change anything. It's fucking awesome right now. Oh, cool. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So uh, live, I play with two guitar amps and I try to uh, mimic the stereo stereo effects that we do with guitar pannings and stuff like that when when we play live and um there's a lot of uh, uh like complex chords that i play in spite house so even if there's one guitar only it always sounds full in my mind at least so that's a, another point in live i feel like you can get away with more as a front man that plays guitar like mm -hmm. you because if you're just a front man like you know, what do you do with your hands? What do you, you know what I mean? There's like stage presence and all this stuff, but like you can kind of yeah. hide behind them, hide behind the mic stand a little bit. And as an introvert, yeah. that has a big, big appeal to me. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, it's true. It's like if your if your voice is not the best that night, at least you're playing guitar and it goes well on that side. Or if you have a bad right. guitar night, then at least you're singing. You know, there's always something. Uh, not everything can go wrong, but, but <laughs> maybe I just jinx myself right there. So. <laughs> yeah, you can you can affect the game in more than one way, which is nice if something else is not working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the feeling of uh, you know just holding a mic and uh, be able to have people sing along with you and stuff like that is is very uh, alluring, you know. It, it, totally. I, I want to try that for sure uh, one day. I know that uh, Anxious, uh, the band Anxious, uh, they started out with uh, Grady, the singer, playing guitar as well, and now they shift shifted to uh, him only singing, and they have like another guitar player, or maybe they were always two guitars. I, I can't remember. So here's what you need to do next time you're you're out live or, or you know in the future you plan for it where you have one or two songs the guest guitarist for the song and then you just do the thing the frontman thing for a little bit <laughs> there you go yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> don't want to give up the you don't want to give up the control I get that man I get that <laughs> <laughs> I I'm not a control freak I just want to write the songs play the yeah. songs uh, record the songs <laughs> yeah, exactly uh... all of it. <laughs> Mix the songs, master <laughs> yep. the songs. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But hey, there's something to that. If your creative vision is, you you get to see it all the way through from start to finish and have every step of the way be yours, that's pretty cool too. Like I, I, mm -hmm. can, I can get behind that. I get that piece. Yeah, uh, the second LP uh, is going to be done pretty soon. And I feel like the second nice. one has been, uh, you know, more collaborative. Uh, Nab wasn't in the band when we uh, wrote the first LP, and his input has been like very helpful in uh, song structures and just he has like amazing bass ideas that I wouldn't have. I think it's his first time playing bass in a band, so he, he has like this uh, unconventional way of thinking about bass, maybe. And uh, yeah, so so I think that, like the second LP will be less just me and Mark, let's say, and, and more like the Spite House band creating something together. So it'll be a little a little different, but in a good way coming up. I like that. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, maybe a, a little bit less uh, pop punk. You know, there, there's like a pop punk side to the, the first LP mm -hmm. that we maybe lose and go more in a post-hardcore direction. Mm. Uh, still very influenced by the 90s stuff. Post-hardcore can mean so so many things nowadays. Mm -hmm. But yep. I'm talking like uh, you know the Fugazi type of uh, post hardcore, and and a little more more emo maybe in the in the next one, but we'll see. Well, we're certainly excited for that. You you guys at the time of recording just dropped the EP uh, just yep. for a while. How does that is that just hey let's try to keep on people's radars let's put something out like how does that even how does that start that idea. So the seaweed uh, cover was something that we played live a couple of times. It's like one of our favorite songs. Uh, it's super energetic. Uh, we love the band. And we were just like, let's record it and see how it sounds. So we did that. And uh, the song Dying Leaves uh, is about like a, a very intense moment in my life. It's, it's the last morning I saw my dad uh, before he passed. Wow. And it was uh, on... Uh, November 2nd, so it's like a couple of days from now. And I've always felt angry about it, but also sad and kind of depressed about it. And I wanted to show both versions of the song, like the, the, the original one that's been recorded with the heavy guitars is like the angrier side and uh, is more chaotic and everything. And the acoustic version displays more this like uh, this sadness and this heaviness to it. And I tried recording it and I showed, showed it to the guys and they really liked it. And it was my first time recording an acoustic song. So we were like, maybe, oh, wow. we sh maybe this should get out and, and be, uh, be, be released. And uh, we talked about it with Nick and he, he absolutely loved uh, the, the acoustic version as well. And we worked very hard on uh, a live session. So not to be insisting on the code, controlling aspect of it but we produced it there <laughs> nice. was one one of our friends filmed it but like we edited the the live session we uh i recorded it i mixed it and and, and all of that 
and we released that on YouTube and we felt like maybe it didn't get like I don't know as much attention we released it on on our um, YouTube which has like a hundred subscribers you know apparently YouTube is is pretty hard uh, to, to like gain traffic and stuff preach man <laughs> yeah so we were like okay well we have those those three live recordings and there's been people asking us to play you know I don't know in, in different areas of the world that uh, we we can't afford to play right now so we're just like let's let's just push the live session a little more and add those two songs and make it an EP and it it will also give a boost you know in just like showing that we're active and uh promoting the the upcoming tour that we're doing uh and all of that so it, it was like all of this together going back to dying leaves the the original version of that song is amazing and then to hear another version of it also be amazing it just speaks to the song being awesome you know just from front to oh, back thank you so much it, it's i played it for my wife tonight i played both versions of them for her tonight while we were making dinner mm -hmm. and i'm like this is the same song obviously it's the same song because you can tell kind of the words are similar and the, the vibe is similar but it's it's completely different and she was like i mm -hmm. i kind of can't believe that i'm like it's so good it, it's <laughs> it's uh it, if you haven't listened to the just for a while ep go go check that out right now because that version is amazing no oh, thank you so much i've also had friends from high school uh writing like texting me hey someone covered your song and i was like no it's me and i was like oh, oh wow <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome <laughs> so that was funny but yeah thank you thank you so much for the kind words uh the song means uh, a lot to me so i'm glad that people uh, can connect to it oh it's such a good song but any thought to releasing more acoustic stuff now that that kind of hit and, and is working Mm, I don't know. Maybe, like, I've been working on a, other songs that are acoustic, but maybe they're not, like, spied out songs. So, yeah. It, it, it gave me just the courage to write more acoustic songs, I guess. But, yeah, I don't know if, 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 if it would fit the context of spied out or if that was a one-time thing or, yeah. Let me ask you this. When you, when you first wrote Dying Leaves in the... You know, in the guitar and everything. Did you mm -hmm. have acoustic in mind at all? Uh, well, everything I write for Spider House is on acoustic at first. Oh wow, nice! Yeah. So I was like, I knew that it would translate to acoustic guitar because that's how I, I wrote it. But I didn't know what to make with uh vocals. You know, I was like, am I gonna scream over acoustic guitar or so? But I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, Jose Gonzalez. Uh, Elliot Smith, uh, w uh, William Fitzsimmons, and all those folk artists, Bon Iver. So I wanted to try something like that, and I just did, and it ended up like being approved by the band, the you know, by Nab and Mark, and I said it was good. So I was like pretty happy about it. Uh, Elliot Smith, you're speaking my language. What's your favorite Elliot Smith record? Uh, probably either or. Ooh, yep, yep. I'd probably agree with you. I think we're like a big cliche of like every people that every person that likes hardcore also likes Elliot Smith. I think it's a big thing. <laughs> yeah. And but seaweed. Yeah. And seaweed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They all like seaweed too. And, and that, that the seaweed cover is yeah. awesome, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love the, I, I listened to it at first, your version, because I didn't realize mm -hmm. it was a cover and was like, that's cool. It's kind of a different direction for them. It's a little quicker. It's a little mm -hmm. kind of more at you. And then I, I saw your tweet about it being a cover and I was, so I went back and listened to the seaweed version. Because they've come up a couple times in the podcast as being mm. a uh, a band that other bands like. Yeah, and super I was like, influential yeah. for sure. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're great. What I've heard, I, I love now. And thanks for turning mm. me on to them, really. I mean. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. The, the vocalist is uh, such an amazing singer. And uh, the, his vocal range goes very high. And especially on um, the verses on that song. It was really challenging to like hit those super high notes, uh, so that that was another fun part of it. Was just like you know I'm a new singer, uh, I'm trying to figure out my range and figure out like how much can I push my voice in the studio, but also live and still have a voice after two songs, you know. Uh, so right. that was that was all part of it, and uh, yeah, I think it it came it came about pretty pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, very happy with it. It's funny you talk about pushing your voice. I've had a sore throat all day, and I was like, 
can Uh-oh. I perform tonight? And it's not, it's like we're just talking. <laughs> oh, I can imagine being a singer. Like we've talked about this with with uh, frontmen and, and vocalists, where they're drinking tea on tour. It's all tea. Oh, yeah. It's it's yeah. warm fluids. It's either not talking or whispering. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't realize how much goes into it, even for you know bands that we all like. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know we're we, you know we're not Adele here, and we still have to do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, the first time we toured the States was like the longest stretch of shows I did, which is another aspect of it. It's like night after night, you need to do this. And after maybe three or four shows, I, I started feeling my voice like really s- like slowing down during the day. Uh, and I thought, okay, so this is it. It's part of it. And uh, I, I wrote a message to the old singer of my, uh, of Deeper Well, which is a, like, he's an amazing singer. Uh, and he told me, yeah, that's totally normal. He toured before and he was like, you're going to have a dip and then it's going to come back to normal after. But uh, it didn't do that for me uh, because <laughs> oh, I no. didn't know it, but I was getting super sick. I, w- uh, I don't, yeah, it, it wasn't COVID, but it was like, uh, you know, just a flu. But, um, I thought it was allergies at first and I was kind of in denial, but at the fifth show, I couldn't speak a word before the show. So I was wow. like, okay, so maybe I don't have a voice at all. I can't do this. And uh, I started singing and it worked out fine. And so the, the, la- the entire stretch of the show after that, I couldn't speak to anyone before the show. And I was just like, my, my voice, is on. it was like that, you know? So I couldn't, interact with anyone and i thought maybe this is just what it is doing to my voice when i perform uh you know when i sing for many days in a row but then after that we we went to europe and did a longer stretch and my vo- vocals were fine the entire time i could talk and everything so i think it was just a, a one time thing but it was very scary <laughs> yeah i mean that's got to be it's one thing to play guitar and show up every day and do that and you know, try not to hurt your hands, but you need your voice. The vocalist is, is so important uh, for a band, you know, mm-hmm. night after night. And that's got to be, it's going to be nerve wracking when you're like, I think I'm losing my voice while you're on tour. Yeah. And we have a history so far of uh, injuring ourselves during tour or <laughs> right oh, before. No. So n- during that tour, Nab, our bassist, uh, hurt his knee uh, and he couldn't step on it for the last two shows because he, he threw a kick. And I don't know, his knee just decided to, you know, <laughs> go the, the opposite way. We had a conversation with Casey Cavalier of the Wonder Years about you know, being, staying healthy on tour, whether it be, you know, uh-huh. physically knees or shoulders or whatever, or your voice. Mm-hmm. There, there's, uh, there's people out there that would do that job. And I, I, I may or may not know or be one of those people. So, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this, this is an idea. This is a million dollar idea. I'm going to start pitching that to people. Like, you need somebody on tour that, can keep you healthy while you're in between shows <laughs> yeah health coach exactly exactly for musicians <laughs> and uh, our drummer right before the um, the europe tour he decided to like saw off a, a bit of uh, a symbol that was there was a crack in a symbol and he he dropped oh, no. his uh how do you call this it's a uh, dremel yeah uh, like like with the round the dr- uh, yeah. saw yep yeah, yeah. oh yeah. So yeah he he went to um to close it with this with the same hand and it slipped and it like opened up his his hand uh, between the thumb and uh, his uh, first finger and it was like he needed like stitches and everything and that was like a week before the tour and that's the drummer that's his money maker right yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah so was he able so, to drum he was able to drum still he was he was able to be a it was kind of um uh, how do you say um he got rid of the stitches a day or two before uh, our flight, so wow, it was still it time. was still sore, but he, he was able to hold the stick and it was fine. <laughs> That's good, <laughs> man. Well, don't get hurt going out. I know you're going out in a couple of days, and this may come out after that. But you are going out with Heavy Hex on the East Coast yep. to plan some shows, so mm-hmm. don't get hurt in the next couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I, we'll try. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tour coming up. New music, I don't know if you can say, but when's the new record coming out? Can you say? Or? Uh, that's a good question. because Next year, I'm sure? Yeah, probably yeah. Tw- 2024. We, we are aiming for 
beginning of 2024, but uh, uh, there's a lot of things going on, and uh, I'm not like we're pretty much done writing it, and now it's uh, a matter of like figuring out what the plan is for the entire 2024, and uh, yeah, recording it and, and and all of that. So I know as fans, we think it's so simple of like record the music, put it out. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Labels have release cycles. Plants have manufacturing, yep. uh, you know, backlogs. You want to make sure that you can tour on it. It's so, mm -hmm. there's so much involved. You have artwork, you know? Yep. We're a little more plugged into it and we get it. When I was like, mm -hmm. you know, 15, I didn't get it. I was like, Hey, favorite band, put the damn record out. What are you doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Come, come to Brazil. <laughs> right. Yeah. As exactly. if it's something like super easy to do. Uh, but yeah, I was the same way when I was growing up. Like, why isn't every band always in Montreal? Like, I want to see them now. Right, yeah. At least you had Montreal. We had Portland, which you, you're aware of, but is smaller mm. and not everybody would make their way here. So we'd have to go to Boston, right. which is two hours away or uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere just to try to, to try to catch some of that stuff. But it's gotten better over the years. We, we do more uh, as far as that goes. But yeah, man, you want them all to come through because you love it mm -hmm. and uh, we're the same way. Absolutely, and we, we. I also had to uh, come up to Montreal because I was living about, about two hours from there when I was a kid. So yeah, you can relate. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's this awesome. has been this has been so cool. And, and again, when we found the record three or four months ago, you know, finally. Sorry, it took us a year, but when we found it a couple of months fine. ago, it was like we need to we need to like remember this is a, a band we need to talk to because we both we like to do that. Like we'll find. Well, obviously, we'll be in the cycle for some other stuff and get some people as they're putting records out, and mm -hmm. we have some some a little bit of pull that way with a few per firms. But we like the finding bands like Spite House and being able to talk to you because you guys are on the way up, man. I mean, it's it's so cool. Yeah, well, thanks thanks for doing this. I think it's very important, you know, to have people talking about the uh, all all bands, you know, all, the the smaller bands and and the the medium bands and the bigger bands, and and to have like the the opportunity to um to listen to some of your idols uh, talk about their process uh, is, is, so, uh, is so interesting and, and uh, it encourages people to, to make music and, and it, it's just awesome. And I'm not saying I'm the uh, idol of anyone, that's not what I meant, but for me to listen to podcasts like this is, is very enjoyable. Hell yeah, dude. It's... To be able to hear processes from people, you know, from all walks of music and all different worlds has been so fulfilling for me. And I, I'm probably speaking for you, Anthony, as well. It's amazing. So, yeah, we, we completely agree. It's, it's been a lot of fun to be able to do stuff like this. And, and you, uh, you were awesome tonight, man. Really appreciate talking with you. Well, thank you. Totally. It, you, you've enhanced the music for us, I think. So when, you, when that happens after we talk to someone, because it can go yeah. the other way. You know what I mean? Like, totally. I want some names. <laughs> um, I, I said it can go. I'm not when saying I, it when has I hit, gone. When I shut the recording <laughs> off, maybe we'll give you a couple. But. <laughs> yeah. but no, when it enhances like that, it's like, it's so cool when that happens. It's like a cheat code. It's just like something you loved and then you understand like, you know, the secret sauce that went into it and the mindset and how much time and intention that goes into it. It's awesome. And we love that. Mm. So thank you. That's the that's, that's the punchline. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at patioslavepodcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you.